In 2017, Conor McGregor shocked the fighting world by announcing that he would have a professional boxing match against Floyd Mayweather. McGregor was at the top of his game and Mayweather was at the end of a 50-win undefeated career. Many people wondered how Conor would adopt to the boxing rules and if he could manage without using MMA-style takedowns and submissions. The main goal for this enterprise was, of course, money. And this freak show fight brought many curious eyes to see how an MMA fighter would fare against a boxer. In a lot of ways, this reminds me of the freak show fight we had in rugby back in the 90s, the Clash of the Codes. It was Bath against Wigan, both playing each other's games and breaking down a lot of barriers in the process. Before we start, guys, thank you so much for giving an American like me your time and support. If you like these videos, please subscribe and consider hitting that like button. Let's go. So y'all probably know the story. In 1895, the majority of the rugby clubs in the north of England broke away from the Rugby Football Union to create an opposing union, later renamed Rugby Football League. It was formed by northern English working class people wanting to get compensated for playing rugby. They weren't looking to get rich, they just couldn't support their rugby lifestyle without pay like the middle class players in the south. Rugby Union did their best to squash Rugby League. Anyone playing rugby league was banned from ever playing rugby union and sometimes so little a crime as to even associate with someone from playing rugby league could cause a lifetime ban. Well, that all changed on the 26th of August 1995. The Great Wall of Rugby was torn down. The International Rugby Board declared that rugby union was an open game and removed any and all restrictions on payments or benefits to those players playing the game. Lee and Josh from the Blood and Mud podcast summed up the uniqueness leading up to this event. But this was like the, it's weird to think about how controversial this all was at the time looking back. Cuz now, you know, it's happened since and it's just a bit of a weird curio. But like this was the first time that League and Union had been able to cooperate in any kind of notable way for 100 years. Well, put it this way, if Bath had played this game, the Rugby League game was first on the 8th of May. 1996. Yes. If Bath had played this game the year before, in May 1995, every single one of the Bath squad that played would be banned from rugby union forever. Yes. In 1996, the dominant rugby union team in England was Bath, or Bath, yeah, American accent problems. They ruled over the somewhat undefined English rugby union system. This included 10 team National Division One or Courage League titles. <clears throat> league for union anyway in 1987 they had won six courage league titles and since 1972 had won 10 anglo-welsh cups they provided a large number of players to the english national team including newly appointed captain phil de glanville in the north wigan was the dominant english rugby league team wigan had won the last rfl championship before it became the super league this was their seventh consecutive title they had won eight consecutive Challenge Cup titles, too, before their loss in 1995. Wigan, as well, provided a significant number of players to the Great Britain national team. So many people considered it inevitable that the two codes would clash when it came acceptable or legal to do so. And the inevitable did happen in January of 1996 when the announcement was made that both teams would play each other's codes in a two-game series. Needless to say, both controlling bodies were none too thrilled about the proposed encounters. It almost, I think the, the governing bodies, while the, while the clubs and the players were perhaps um, really, really keen to, to get this on, the, the governing bodies weren't as keen. Um, and, and I think at some point the, the, the RFU were originally weren't going to allow Twickenham to be used for the match because it was being, being reseeded, but then relented after I think Cardiff Arms Park offered to close the game. The games were planned to be played in May of 1996, which would be the end of the Union season, but near the start of the season for League. Remember that English Rugby League recently switched to the Super League model, which changed it from a winter to a summer sport. The League game was played on the 8th of May 1996. Bath came into this match much more tired than Wigan. They finished the Pilkington Cup only five days previously and were at the end of a hard-fought winning season. They had little time to prepare. Phil de Glanville recalled the events leading up to the league game, which consisted of playing just one warm-up match against the lower division South Wales and getting drunk after winning their championship. We were all hungover and knew we were in big trouble. Until then, we had focused on the Courage League and Pilkington Cup. 
I would say it is the only match I had ever been scared of in the changing room beforehand because we were so underprepared and uncomfortable about what was going to happen. It wasn't the best preparation playing a game that you've never played before. And, and we had had very little preparation hmm. for you know, playing rugby league. You know, we hadn't, we'd had a couple of sessions really with, with Clive Griffiths. Hmm. Um, and I think he was pulling whatever hair he had left of his head at the time. He was pulling out. We just weren't, you know, when you've got a cup final on that Saturday, you ain't bothered about what's going on the next week. You're bothered about the cup final on Saturday. Um, so we, we had pretty much zero prep, really, uh, of any significance going into that game um, at Main Road. On the other side, Wigan had much more time to get ready. They did advance to the Challenge Cup final for the first time in 10 years, which gave them an extra week without a game. The day after Bath's Pilkington Cup final, they played Paris Saint-Germain at home and crushed them 76 to eight. If you're interested in Paris Saint-Germain, I made a video about it, so check that out if you haven't already. Bath's trouble started as soon as the first whistle blew. John Collard failed to make the starting kick go 10 meters and a penalty was called. Three minutes later, Martin O'Fly scored a try for Wigan, which would be one of six for the night. Yeah, one of six for Martin O'Fly, not the entire Wigan team. Yeah, Martin O'Fayette totally wrecked this Bath team in general. The game was so foreign to Bath that it took them 15 minutes before they could get through a set of six tackles without an error. Wigan treated this game like they did any other opponent, blitzing them in the opening minutes and then reducing the game to a mismatch, as reporter Dave Hatfield pointed out. In all, Henry Paul, Jason Robinson, Terry O'Connor, Andy Johnson, Craig Murdoch, and Scott Quintrell all scored tries for Wigan in the first half, which ended 52-0. In order to keep up with Wigan's athleticism, Bath had asked for unlimited substitutions instead of the 10 total substitutions that were then allowed at the game. Bath did better in the second half, however, when Collar got a converted try. After this, however, Wigan put on even more pressure and scored an additional six tries. This is even after Wigan made two substitutions without replacing the players on the field. So that is, the player came off the field, but no new player came back on. So essentially they ended the game with only 11 men on the field. Wigan were just too fast, too polished to be stopped by Bath. The league and union games were held two and a half weeks apart. During that time, Wigan faced off against other English teams in the middle six sevens tournament at Twickenham. This was obviously much different than the standard 15 aside rugby union as there was less of a focus on scrums and lineouts and Wigan could use their fast paced rugby league offense to their advantage. They came in as tournament favorites with bookies even though they were not a rugby union team. The entire tournament was completed on one day on May 13th, 1996. Wigan started off a little bit rough with the first team, Richmond, and then just blew past them to win 48 to five. They took on Harlequins to a very close game that finished 36 to 24. They then blew past Leicester in the semifinals, 35 to 12. In the final, the Wasps scored two unanswered tries to start the game. The Wasps were eventually successful in holding off Wigan for the rest of the game. <laughs> Actually, you know I'm kidding, right? Wigan blasted past Wasp defense a la Rugby League, scoring ridiculous coast-to-coast -coast tries to win the final game 38-15. to You just couldn't stop these guys. I mean, their playing style was sloppy, and they made a bunch of errors, but in the end, they were just too physically fit and had the benefit of a hundred years of professionalism on their side. Going into the Union match, some people thought that Wigan would be equally dominant in the 15 aside game, while others thought that Bath would have full control of the game. And uh, with us, Mike Stevenson and Stuart Barnes. Steve-O, first of all, it's time to put your money where your mouth is. What's going to happen? No problem. I think that Wigan, their professionalism will take them through. Uh, it won't be a shock for me to see them win. Well, I've had a spread bet buying Bath at 23 points to win, so if Wigan are to win this one, all donations will be gratefully received. And I also have had a fiver bet with this match. It has to be Bath. Uh, it, seriously, Mike, I mean, we haven't actually asked you what you think the margin of victory might be. I think it'll be very close. I think it uh, could come down to about three or four points. Well, the man has been taking some sort of mushrooms up in the north of England. There is no doubt at all. Bath are going to win this one by 30 points. They're going to be too strong up front. And we went training with Oral. 
Oral Rugby Union, who had close connections with, with Wigan at the time. So they were showing us how to scrum with, they were showing us what to do in lineouts, and that's all good and well. And we were doing it and we were training against them, then we started getting competitive. When we kept the ball away from Oral, we were doing all right, but as soon as we got into rooks and malls and that, they, they, were, they were beating us. As soon as we got into a scrum against them, we couldn't compete with them. Bath kicked this game off as well, but instead of kicking out of bounds, they kicked skillfully and recycled the ball. They utilized the aspects of union to their advantage. Wigan's unfamiliarity with a contested scrum is what led to Bath's first try, a penalty try as the first score. Bath did so well that Wigan wasn't even able to handle the ball on Bath's side of the field until 18 minutes of the game had passed. Bath continued rucking, mauling, scrumming their way to a 25-0 lead at halftime. Media commentator and dual code international player Jonathan Davies made the observation that Wigan were constantly infringing rules that they didn't even know existed. As the second half carried on, Bath began to get tired and Wigan's athleticism began to show. Craig Murdoch scored a pair of coast-to-coast -coast tries while Vaiga Tugimala scored a third try before Bath scored a final seventh pushover try. For the second half, Wigan scored the same amount of points that Bath did and it was evident that Wigan were more athletically fit and used that to their benefit as the game progressed. It must be noted though that Bath didn't put their best foot forward when it came to scrums. Somebody could have got seriously hurt if we'd have absolutely gone for it. You know, Terry said his back was in bits for two weeks after it, but if they'd have absolutely gone for it, then the last thing anybody wanted was for somebody to be stretched off a pitch with a serious injury because it's such a technical thing in the scrum, particularly the scrum, and obviously the line out as well, but you're more likely to get injured in the scrum than anything else. So the clash of the codes was done more for economic purposes than just for pure growth of the game. In 2003, there was a match between the Sale Sharks and St. Helens with union rules being played in the first half and league rules being played in the second half. But there hasn't been a cross-code game since then. So what if this game happened today? It's clear that Union would do a lot better than they did in 1996. Union has had over two decades to benefit from a professional model. And there's still a lot of bad blood between both of these sports. But as an American, I can kind of claim ignorance and just enjoy them for what they really are. Above all, one thing is clear. Whether it's Rugby Union or Rugby League, it's a lot better than soccer. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you liked it. Leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Later.